wonderful to be together to praise the Lord. Amen. 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 It's been a while. When was the last time I was here? Last Sometime year. last year. Long time. I think it was September, October last year. It's been a while. It's nice to see. It's always, always nice to visit Fenton in the city. It's one of the churches that I love preaching. Oh, there are some churches that I go, I preach, but I don't like it so much. The response and the spirit, but here the spirit of the Lord is always very present. So I really love coming here. And plus I love to see you all. You, you always receive me with warm hearts and that's beautiful. Um, let us bow our heads this uh, afternoon before we study. Our Father, as we get together, Lord, and uh, gather around your word, we need your Holy Spirit to teach us. None of us have the wisdom that is necessary, Lord, to understand and unravel the mysteries of the Word. We may put our uh, rational powers, Father, and engage them with your Word, but unless your Spirit enlightens and teaches us and gives us wisdom, then, Father, we would end up worse than what we began like. So, Lord, as little children, we sit around your feet, and we pray that you will teach us, that you will open our understanding and give us our ears to hear and eyes to see. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. I don't know what um, if you have ever stopped to think, um, what is the reason why the Lord has invested so much in our salvation? You know, when we, we speak often about the act of salvation and how the Lord saves us, and, uh, but we, oft, we, we do not often uh, stop to think what is the reason why God actually saves us, because salvation is not the end, is not the target of what God wants to do for you. Salvation is a means to an end. If there is a greater objective, a greater reality for which God has invested so much in order uh, to save you. Because it has cost heaven absolutely everything it has in order to rescue man from sin. But when the Holy Spirit manages to bring us to conviction and we respond to conviction and we surrender to Christ and we accept Him as our Savior, that is not the end, but it's the very beginning of the Christian experience, isn't it? Yes. So what, why then the Lord saves us? And I would say that God saves us to fulfill the objective of why we were created. And you and I, God created us and He created the human race with one sublime objective above all others. And that was that we may commune, fellowship with God. That is the purpose of our existence. And through sin, we lost that communion with God. Our hearts were uh, 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 estranged from Him. We became enemies of God. We were separated from Him. And we did not want to have anything to do with God. So sin broke that communion we had with our Heavenly Father. You know, Adam and Eve could speak with God face to face. They could walk in the garden, you know, as a child speaks with God, so Adam and Eve spoke. What an amazing, uh, you know, uh, uh, objective for our existence. But sin distorted and so God had created a plan by which He would redeem humanity and restore us back to that objective to that reason why we existed and when you look at the beginning of the of the scriptures begins with face to face communion and when you go to the end of the scriptures in revelation chapter 21 and 22 it ends up with face to face communion so the objective of the plan of redemption is to save man so that man can again commune with god face to face and that communion must begin here on earth. Amen? Amen? We must begin to walk with God. We must learn 
to live with Him our daily experience so that our life turns out to be a life of communion with God. If you achieve nothing else in life but learning to walk with God and to love Him and to live in His presence, you actually have achieved the highest purpose of your life. Now, if you achieve everything else in life, you become a professional, you become wealthy, you do great things, and uh, you know you have a family and a, a, a successful marriage, and your life is successful, but you actually don't learn to commune with God, you have actually wasted your life. True? Mm -hmm. And so what we are going to do in the, in the, in the two meetings that we have this, uh, this afternoon, is that we are going to look how the sanctuary teaches us to commune with God. Uh, and why the sanctuary? Well, the Bible teaches us that the sanctuary is God's preferred way of communicating uh, truth to us. God is a God of sanctuary. Did you know that? God, throughout history, the, the, the history of the universe, God has always related with His creation through a sanctuary system. That's the way God does things. In Psalm chapter 77, verse 13 says, your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Where is God's way? It's in the sanctuary. What does that mean? It's single. It says God's way. Therefore, that word way encompasses all of God's ways. Everything that God does, everything that God is, is actually revealed to us in the sanctuary. And it is our privilege, by looking at the Old Testament sanctuary, to begin discovering the way God has revealed Himself in the sanctuary. I believe, it is my strong belief, that if you and I were to study the sanctuary and unravel it completely, we would actually, if, we, they, if they were to take the Bible from us, we could take every single truth revealed in the Scriptures, we could deduct it out of the sanctuary. God, does a, God has amazing ways to convey information in very compacted way, doesn't it? And then when He, through the Holy Spirit, He gives you wisdom and understanding and you begin to see things, suddenly a three-dimensional reality becomes available to you that you went, uh, you know, that you went uh, ready to receive it before. And you didn't even know that existed. And the sanctuary is one of those things. The more you study it, the more you go, you have those wow moments. You go, wow, I have never seen that before. And it's right here in the sanctuary. You see it in other parts of the scriptures, but it's actually contained in the sanctuary also. And that is so true regarding the spiritual life, how to commune with God. The sanctuary gives us a process, a systematic process by which we can actually approach God. In the book of Psalm 27, verse 4, it says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that I will seek. What do you reckon is that David desired of the Lord? That is what it is. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. With what purpose? <laughs> to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. You know, we have trouble coming to church once a week. <laughs> but what was the longing of the service? To actually, not to go to the temple, but to actually dwell in the temple. He couldn't do it because he didn't belong to the tribe of Levi. But that was his longing to abide, to live in the house of God. Why did he want to live in the house of God? Yes, because the temple in the sanctuary, he would learn of the beauty of God. He would learn of that character that, that makes God so beautiful. Now, God must be beautiful in physique. He must be a beautiful person. But what makes beautiful God, God what makes God beautiful is his character. And that character is tremendously revealed in the sanctuary. And then he says also to inquire or to learn in his holy temple. The, the, the temple, the sanctuary, has a didactic um, 
purpose. It, the, the purpose of the temple was to teach Israel in a kindergarten way the gospel and the plans of God and the truths of God. And so if you and I were to have the same desire to dwell in the house of the Lord, it was a passion for us. You and I could learn many, many things from that sanctuary system in the Old Testament. The feasts associated with it, the sacrifices, uh, the, the rituals of, for example, the anointing, the anointing of the high priest and the day of atonement, and all those things are associated with the sanctuary. And all the plan of redemption has been revealed in detail in those things. That is just amazing. <clears throat> In uh, Psalm 63, verse 2, it says, So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. So where are we to look into in order to find God and to see Him as He is? Into the sanctuary. Do you know that the whole life of Jesus is a life lived in the context of a sanctuary reality? His baptism, his, his life, his sacrifice, his death and resurrection, his ascension to heaven, uh, his, his incarnation, all those things are sanctuary realities because the sanctuary had already spoken and revealed them to them. So Jesus, was, uh, Jesus as he comes to planet earth, he comes to the courtyard of the sanctuary and he is living a life that is in the context of the sanctuary, it's a sanctuary life. <clears throat> Psalm 73 verse 17 uh, here in this verse the psalmist, when you read the context the psalmist is struggling with the reality that he saw around that the wicked prospered and the, the, you know, the righteous actually suffered and the righteous often was seen as being you know, in, in, uh, in, in a lesser uh, position than the wicked. And then it says here, he says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. So isn't that amazing that he's struggling with something and he, he, he doesn't go well, if they didn't have the Bible the way we had it, you know, so available to us. So he goes into the sanctuary and as he goes, he meditates in the sanctuary and he sees the sanctuary from beginning to end. At the end he says, now I know what will be the end of the wicked. How did he learn that? In the sanctuary. <coughs> so the sanctuary is an amazing system of truth that God has given to us for us to understand truth and to understand the way God thinks and the way he acts. The whole of the Bible is given in the context of a sanctuary, especially the book of Revelation. You see the book of Revelation and the structure of the book of Revelation is the sanctuary and its feasts. And so you cannot understand the book of Revelation apart from the sanctuary. God thinks in sanctuary mode. And so what we are going to do today is just look at this, uh, the sanctuary and see how it teaches us to commune with the Lord. Simple. We're going to look at each one of these sections, the gate, the altar of sacrifice, the labor, the following veil, and then we're going to look into the holy place, and we're going to do that at the sermon time, and just see how each one of those elements actually is a practical revelation on how to commune with God. And I commune, my prayer life, I follow the sanctuary pattern. Uh, when, when we pray, we tend to struggle what to say. Has it happened to you? Yes. That you're praying and you run out of things to say? And uh, you, may, you may pray 5, 10, 15 minutes and then you say, well, what else do I say? <laughs> and that usually happens because we don't have a structure. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 a, set, uh, a structured way of following and if you do this, actually it adds structure to your prayer and you can spend hours in communion with God. So I hope you take notes and you uh, then put it into practice because what this will truly enrich 
your, your, your Christian walk. Truly, you cannot but uh, enrich it. You will learn to listen to the voice of God through this process. You will learn that all the different aspects of the Christian life are here included in the reality of communion with God, of being with Him, of praying, studying the Bible. It's all, all there. So, as we look at the sanctuary, we begin, we begin of course, at the courtyard. The sanctuary was made of a, of a set of curtains that were set in a rectangular form and they were hung on pillars that were made of bronze with bases of silver. That was the sanctuary, or the courtyard of the sanctuary, what we, call, what we would today call the backyard. You see, the sanctuary, also in the Bible, is called the house of no, yes, it has a prayer, but what else? It's the house of God. And so the sanctuary, literally, literally, is the house of God. And the courtyard is the backyard. And so when you portray this, this simple way of looking at things, this is actually showing us inside the house of God in heaven, what the house of God is like in heaven. God is a real being, and He has a house. And it's called the temple. Even in the new earth, God would have a house. <laughs> that's a bit foreign to think of God having a house, isn't it? But that's the reality. God has a house. He has a courtyard in his house. If we go back, he has a courtyard in his house. And notice the word, court. Yeah. is the place where some courtship takes place. Okay, the courtyard. Then it has a living room. The holy place, and then the most holy place is where God spends most of his time. So, the way of communion with God is the way of intimacy. You begin from being a stranger outside the gate. Once you enter through the gate, you begin a process of getting acquainted with God and preparing yourself to enter in the place where you will actually develop intimate relationship with your Heavenly Father. To prepare one day to go into the very inner room to marry Jesus. That's the reality. It's a communion with Christ and with God is a love relationship that develops in order to become one with Him throughout eternity. So it begins at the courtyard and the courtyard has a veil. But the veil of the courtyard is of different color to the rest of the curtains that surround the courtyard. The veil is actually blue, purple, red, mingled with white linen. It's actually a beautiful veil. Do you know who the veil represents? Christ. It represents Christ. The three veils are a symbol of Jesus. We're not going to look into it today. But each of the veils represents a new nature that Christ takes in order to rescue man from sin. But, so the process of communion with Christ begins where? Begins at the veil. And we want to see what the veil represents. Come to uh, uh, Psalms 100 and verse 4. It says this. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts, into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. So as we begin, let's say to pray the morning or you know time, whatever time you choose to you know to spend time with the Lord, um, we should begin at the, at the at the veil of the sanctuary. And what is the veil? What does the veil represent? In regards to communion, not in regards to the person of Jesus, but in regards to communion. What does it represent? Notice what it says here. It says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, but this is plural, gates. The courtyard has only one gate, not two gates. What place has two gates or two veils? The actual temple, doesn't it? So, to enter into the temple, we enter with thanksgiving. But to enter into the court, we enter with? Praise. We enter with praise. So what is the first thing we do when we begin 
communing with the Lord. Praise. We praise Him. Even Jesus said it. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. The first thing we do is to praise God. But how often we forget to praise God. We, we think that prayer is all about asking. But no, friends, asking is an important, an important Christian privilege. God has commanded us that we are to ask. Ask whatever you want in my name, and I shall do it, Jesus says. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, that I will do that his name may be glorified. Ask and you shall receive. But asking is not everything and should not be the most important part. The most important, the most, uh, the highest purpose of prayer is to link us with God, to be, bring us into communion with him. And how should we begin our prayers? Our, our time of communion with the Lord? By praising him. What do I mean to praise? What is praise? Let us look at a couple of other Bible verses. Can, can I ask something? Yes. So, and when it says his gates, that's also into the court, right? The gate, or gates is plural, is that? You have... Oh, I'm jumping ahead. You have, you have here, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Two, you know, plural gates. <coughs> and into his courts. The, the, the sanctuary, we see the simple format has one court, but the big, the big sanctuary had a number of courts. And so into the courts with praise. So into the sanctuary proper, the temple, we enter here with thanksgiving. And into the courtyard, we enter with praise. What is the difference between praise and thanksgiving? We'll, we'll, we'll discuss that in a, in a minute. Come to the book of Psalm 150, verse 6. It says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Who has to praise the Lord? Everything that has breath. Are you breathing today? Every soul. Everything that has received the breath of the Lord must praise the Lord. When was the last time that you spent a time in prayer just to praise Him? You see, we come to church, and in church we are in a hurry, uh, and we, we use very little time to praise the Lord. And it's a weakness. Because God, when God dwells, in an atmosphere, in a, in a reality of praise. True? Yes or no? Yes. yes, in heaven, angels are singing to him 24 hours a day. God dwells, he is enthroned in praise. God dwells in the reality and atmosphere of praise. So if a church does not praise him, God does not come. So the way by which we invite God to come into our presence is to actually to praise Him. But why is it that we spend little time in praise? Because we're in a hurry for church to finish. That's the malady of the Western world. We are always running by the clock. And so when you're in the morning, when you run church in the morning and it's past 12, people begin to look at their watch and they are racing against that watch. We, we've got to say this, we've got to do that, right, because we have to finish on time. Who said we have to finish on time when we come to praise God? You know, a church should finish when we know that God has blessed us and that we are filled with His Holy Spirit and that we are ready to live. And, and communion with God should be exactly the same. The purpose of us communing with God is to actually for Him to bless us. And we should not leave His presence until we are sure that He has blessed us. But prayer becomes a, formal, a, for, a formality, something we have to do. Well, I am a Christian, I need to pray. And so we get up in the morning, and I'm, I'm in a hurry to go because I got up late, but I cannot leave house unless I pray. And so I say, Lord, please bless me today in the name of Jesus Christ. Boom! We rush. Because we are always rushing, we are always, you know, fighting. 
for that. And so then we go through our days without power and without, of, without the assurance of the presence of God. Praise is the means by which God draws close to us. And praise is the means by which we forget about self. And we see ourselves in the context of the great I am. True? Yeah. Because to praise Him is to extol God's qualities. As the Creator, the sustainer, the merciful God who is compassionate. You know, you can think of His glory, you can tell Him how beautiful, how wonderful He is. If you're in a hurry to pray and you don't have time to pray, do not ask because God will give you. But you can spend time praising Him. Because that will bring Him into your, into your heart. It's written in the book of... Uh, Psalm 22, verse 3. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. You know, I did once an experiment. I was running an event, uh, a series of revival in a, in a Spanish church. And I challenged them. We met in the middle of the week. We were running the program the whole week. In the middle of the week, I said to them, look, today, today we are going to praise the Lord. And we are going to praise Him until we know that He is right here in our midst. Then we will study the Word and do other things. And they said, okay, well, let's do it. And we started singing. We sang for a while. Then people started sharing testimonies. Then we prayed. And then we came back and we sang again and we prayed. And so we did it. And we must have done it for about 45 minutes. And then the Spirit of the Lord began to move in our midst. And people began to confess and to, you know, repent of their sins and to ask each other for forgiveness. And the Spirit of the Lord became so present. Then we knew we were ready to study His Word. And then we studied His Word. And people left that, that place at night refreshed by the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and, uh, and so we, we, we must be careful that in our urgency to get to the Word of God, we do not forget that praise is a vital element of worshipping God. Amen? Amen. And we should never come in a hurry to church. Or we, should, we should try not to be in a hurry when we spend time in communion with God. It is the reason why He were created. <coughs> Amen? Amen? There is where you charge your Duracells. <laughs> That's where you gain energy and power and wisdom to live your daily life. It may appear to you that you're wasting your time, but I tell you, time spent in communion with God is time invested that you will use during the day to draw out in order to maintain you and keep you. So the first part of communion is what? Praise. We praise the Lord. So what do we do with praise? Well, this is, there are some of the things, well, I lost that one. Yeah. What do we do? Sing to Him. If, there's, if you sing out of tune, don't worry. Well, unless there are other people around you, of course. <laughs> but the, be, begin your, your time by singing. Or by, uh, you know, verbally exalting Him. Father, I praise You. I praise You for who You are. And I want to tell, tell You that I love You, that You're special to me. And I value You because of this, 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 this and that. And spend time praising Him until your soul is contented and happy. This is the part where your soul actually opens up like a flower to the sun. When you begin praising God, the soul opens up to God. You forget about your little problems and in order to contemplate the Almighty. It is here where by faith we actually can look at God. The way I begin my prayer is I imagine and for this whole process you need to use your imagination. God has given you a powerful tool. It's called the imagination, the eye of the, the, the mind, by which you can take the whole process and make it a reality. It's like participating in a movie or a play. True. And so I begin my, my, my prayer. I, I, uh, my first part of my prayer, I kneel, then I sit, and I go to the Lord. I, I, I say, Father, I am so glad to see you. Good morning. And I imagine that he says to me also, Good morning, my son. Come and sit next to me. And says, Before I sit, I'd like to, I'd like to worship you, Daddy, for a little while. And I imagine that I'm bowing before him. And I'm just praising my 
lands out to the Lord. That's the first part of my communion with God, my, my prayer time. So from the gate, we go to where? That's the process. You are quiet today. We go from the gate to the altar of sacrifice. Now, the altar of sacrifice was symbolic of what? The penalty of sin being paid. Okay, but literally. Where was that fulfilled? Calvary. At Calvary, the cross of Calvary, isn't it? So you've got the first place where you actually come into the sanctuary is that you will come from the gate of praise, you come directly to the cross of Calvary. And when you come to the altar of sacrifice, there was always a sacrifice burning on top of that altar for you. It had been offered for you. It was the morning and evening, evening sacrifices. The book of John, in the book of John, uh, John the Baptist invites us to say this. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What is the first thing we need to do now that our heart, our soul is open, our heart is open to God as a flower through praising Him, we come and we are kneeling in front of Calvary. But there you are, the first objective there is that you must behold Christ. And beholding is not a casual look. To behold is to pay a close attention, isn't it? And so what are we to do here? The first thing here to do in your community is that you will actually contemplate aspects of the life of Jesus, especially the final hours of his life. And I often think, I've done it so often that now I don't need to read the Bible, I take it in my mind and I begin to imagine the upper room and Jesus participating of the Lord's Supper and talking to his disciples about the Holy Spirit and the new earth and encouraging them, giving them counsel and then they sing a hymn and they walk out of the upper room and they go into darkness. The moon is full, it's, it's a little bit nippy and they are walking together and Jesus is walking with his apostles but he becomes strangely heavy as if a huge load is in his shoulders and it's hard for him to walk and you see him walking towards Gethsemane and there you see him struggling and then you see the betrayal and you see you know the, 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 the judgment and you follow him on his church and you contemplate all that then you follow him up the Via Dolorosa and you see Simon taking the cross and you see the soldiers, you hear the multitude, you hear the, 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 the noises that people do in the accusations, you see the speeding and all those things, you become part of the reality you are contemplating Jesus and through that beholding you begin to see his character, you see how he responds to people, how he treats the, his abusers, his accusers, or those who are uh, you know, mocking him and, uh, and scourging him and beating him, how he responds, then you come to Calvary and you see him being crucified. Then you see the cross being raised. You see, that's what you do here. That's the first thing you need to do because before you, you can accept Christ as your Savior, you must contemplate in him what he did on your behalf. And how often are we to do that? We do well, Sister White says, to for how long? One hour a day. So you can spend at least an hour on this. Just looking at Jesus. And Sister White says that we are proud, selfish and independent because we do not contemplate Calvary. Why? Because we do not spend a thoughtful hour at the foot of the cross. Sin has attraction and we are demoralized and we fall into discouragement because we do not behold the Lamb crucified for our sins. You and I carry a burden of guilt because you do not contemplate what Jesus has done for you. If we were to spend every day looking at Christ crucified, 
we would have a glorious Christian experience. Amen? Amen. This is time well spent. And you don't have to be kneeling. You can do your praise on your knees and then you say, Father, come with me. And if you're traveling by bus, you can do this on the bus. You can put some nice music on your on your earphone so that you don't hear the multitude. You can open the Bible on your phone and you can read the account of the crucifixion of Jesus on the bus and on the train. Yes or no? Yeah. Can you do that? And then you're communing, you're beholding Christ as you travel to work. Through this process, you can be in communion with God right through the day. The purpose of communing Jesus, I mean, beholding Jesus, is to behold his character. Because as you behold him, you will become changed. And what do you need to use? Your imagination. That's why the Bible was written in story format. And we've got book the Sarah Wages in story format. Why? Because the imagination takes hold of the story and makes it a reality, isn't it? It's beautiful. That Satan wants to rape your imagination. That's why he has created the cinema and the television and all that. And he's constantly feeling evil into your imagination. You watch a movie and then for the next three days, what is, what's happening with your imagination? You're actually reliving that movie inside your mind. Yes or no? You're reliving the scenes. You close your eyes and there it is. And you see, you see the bullets and bam, boom, the, the whole thing. You can even hear it with sound effects. Well, God wants, God gave us an imagination so that we can make his stories real. And once you make them real in your mind, you'll never forget them. Amen? Amen. So what is the first thing we do at Calvary? We behold Christ. Amen? We behold Christ. Look at his beauty. Contemplate the attributes of Jesus' character. Look at him by faith hanging in, the, in your place at Calvary. Just, just sense the reality. You should have been there. But Christ took your place. Declare him now your Savior and place all your trust in him. I do that every day. I do it even loud. I said, Jesus, you are my Savior. After I contemplated him. I say, Lord Jesus, you are my Savior. I trust in your victory on my behalf. I will not put my trust in what I can do, for you've done it for me, my Jesus. You are mine. Every morning, I'm born again. Christ is your Savior. Amen? You have the privilege of leaving that place knowing full assurance that if you die that day, you have salvation. Amen? You know we shouldn't be afraid of death. Then, there you confess your sins and you repent for them. There at the foot of Calvary you say, Lord Jesus, I am so sorry for these things. And I, you confess them. And that, yes, brother? Without repentance is no salvation. Sorry? Without repentance is no salvation. Of course. That's why we need to repent there at the foot of the cross. And repentance is a gift of who? God. God. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Amen? And it comes as you contemplate the wonder of Christ, suddenly an exchange takes place. You see how holy and beautiful He is and how sinful you are. And that leads you to repentance. All right, then Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, something else happens at Calvary. What time do we need to finish? Huh? Three. Three, okay. I have not... This Paul says, referring to the cross, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live it by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I cut off the, 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 the verse. What, ha what else happens at Calvary? Now, you choose to be crucified with Christ. In other words, I complete surrender to Christ. You surrender your will for Him to do His will in you. And from now on you will not live. It's Christ who lives. So you give yourself to Jesus for that day and you give your, your plans, your ideas, your desires, everything you are and have, you say to Jesus, Jesus, I'm now yours. I am your slave. You can do with me as you please. 
And you count yourself crucified with Christ. So Calvary is the place of contemplation, is the place of repentance and forgiveness, and is the place of your crucifixion. In Romans chapter 12 verse 1, the apostle says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. What are we to present ourselves like to God? As a sacrifice. So then you live through the day, it's no longer about you. It's Christ who lives. You are dead. If people offend you, they are not offending you. You are dead. They are offending Jesus. If uh, things do not go wrong, you will not respond. It's Christ who has to respond. Now, He is in charge of the life. He is in charge of, of everything you face. When your giants rise up, your, your addictions or your sins, and they want to take control over you, you let the Lord take over. He will deliver you. He will give you victory. He will free you. Amen? Christ now is the one who lives. You are dead. Every morning is a covenant of death with Jesus. Life is only in Christ. When will we appear again? When Christ comes in glory. Then we shall live. Now is Christ who lives. And we enter into that experience every morning. Amen? Every morning is a dying experience. It is the sweetest experience you can actually have. You are no longer in control of your life. Christ is the one who controls your life. And He will do in you that which, that which is well pleasing in His eyes. He will both work and will according to His good pleasure in you and through you. It's beautiful. Amen? And that happens where? In the sanctuary? At the altar, at Calvary. <coughs> Amen? Amen? There's one more thing that must happen at Calvary. Yeah. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, that I will, that I will give you rest. So now, at Calvary, you must deposit all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, all your burdens are left there because they belong to Jesus. Jesus purchased them with his blood. He is the burden bearer. He is the guilt bearer. Therefore, all those things legally belong to Christ. If you carry them, you are actually robbing from him. What belongs to you is the freedom, the rest, the peace, the joy that legally should have belonged to Jesus. Because at Calvary an exchange took place. He was made sin for you and now he gives you his righteousness. That which belonged to you naturally now belongs to Jesus. And that which naturally belonged to Jesus now belongs to you legally. Isn't that beautiful? So a Christian is a Christian because he has a saviour. Amen? And the Savior is the one who bears my burdens. Praise the Lord. Therefore, I can be at peace. I can be a joyful Christian. And therefore, I must not worry. Why? Because my problems belong to Christ. Be anxious for how much? Nothing. For how much? Nothing. nothing. How much is nothing? <laughs> And yet we worry about everything. Do not worry, Jesus said. Do not worry about your clothes. Do not worry about your food. Do not worry about tomorrow. Do not worry about your life. Why? Because you, your Father in heaven knows that you have need of all those things. We are children of God because of Jesus. Why should we worry? Amen? So at Calvary, notice, you begin your day and you are free as a bird now. No worries. Be happy, you can say. And true, that's the, that should be the theme of the Christian. No worries, be happy. True, we mustn't worry and we can be happy because we have a Savior and we have a Father. And then you can begin your day free as a bird. No guilt. Your sins all are forgiven. 
You are in Christ. He has taken charge of your life. And now you have deposited all your burdens. Therefore, you can rejoice in your day because God is in charge. Amen. Do you think that that is a life worth living? Yes. Amen? Amen. That's the Christian life. You know, but some of us are very happy Christians. We smile upside down. <laughs> We're always complaining, always looking at the shadows, always counting, counting the... the the, uh, the clouds, never looking at the rainbows, always complaining because of the rain. Alright, from, from the place of the altar of sacrifice, Calvary, the cross, we go where? To the labor. What is the labor? The labor was the place of washing. It says here in the book of Exodus, chapter 40, verse 30, He set the labor between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar and put water there for, for washing. And then in verse 36, uh, no, I just put that one, it says, So it, is the, it was the place where the priests were washed. They washed their feet and their hand before they entered the holy place. So it was a place of washing. Do you know how the labor was made? What material was used for making the, 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 the labor? Bronze. Bronze, brass. But it was special brass. Where, where, where did the brass come from? Sorry? No. The women of Israel actually gave the brass mirrors. Did you know that? They polished the mirrors so highly that it was actually a brass. They didn't have our mirrors, but they did have mirrors because women always need mirrors. <laughs> but in order to have the place of washing, the women had to give up their love for self and vanity and surrender it to the Lord, and the Lord made a place of washing. But the mirror also in the Bible represents what? What does the mirror represent in the Bible? Where you come and see yourself. Oh, the law of God. So the labor is the place of washing, but it's also a symbol of God's law. Where you come and see yourself. And if you see dirt, what do you do? You wash it. We'll leave the rest for the second half. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your invitation to commune with you. And we pray, Lord, that as the apostles said to Jesus, teach us to pray. That you will truly teach us like our Savior to pray, Lord. To have a life of real communion, Lord, meaningful communion with you. A life, Lord, that will be spent and using, used in knowing you and loving you. That we may grow in the likeness of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.